I do. I apologize. We do have Commissioner Sauger from Warren. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Lane. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So since I don't have a, uh, an agenda in front of me, I'm going to say that the agenda is the 2021 budget that will be uh, possibly commented on by the public. So if anyone would like to make a motion to adopt that agenda for the public hearing, I will so be moved, moved by Romano Carabelli. Adopt. I have Romano and Carabelli. Ground. I have Romano and Carabelli on that. Thank you very much. Um, Mike, um, can we vote on that, please? Or if you need, since you might not be ready for that. Oh, there you go. Look at you. That motion passes 12 to 0. Thank you. Then, and item number four, we're going to open up the public hearing for any comments uh, from the public on the 2021 recommended budget. So we will... Uh, open up any comments if you are on the line star six if you are on the computer you can type in the chat uh, any members of the public wishing to speak I'll give it a second since this is a big document yes 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 jason caster with the uh, city of sterling heights hello jason um the floor is yours uh my comment is in regards to agenda item 6B, would now be the time to make a comment on that? Well, that will actually come up in the uh, the finance meeting. This is public This is public hearing for the recommended budget. So that's actually uh, not part of the recommended budget yet. Um, okay, so I'm sorry. Just hang on that. No, no, that's fine. I know it's a little confusing. Um, so that'll be coming up uh, in just a few minutes because this will be over uh, shortly, it looks like. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any members of the public wishing to speak on the recommended budget? And third and final time, any members of the public wishing to speak? Hearing none, we're going to close public participation, and I will take yeah. a motion. Oh, yeah, if you don't move, oh, go ahead. Hold, on, hold on. If you don't move to adjourn, we can probably go into my meeting without doing the roll call and the pledge. Would you agree? Um, I will not be uh, opposed to that. If anyone, uh, Crystal or Mike, if that works with you guys with the um, your system. Aren't these two separate meetings? They are two separate meetings. That's why I'm going to ask for Mike uh, and or Crystal to tell me what they think about that. They are two separate meetings. Okay. Well, All let's right. just let's just close it and jump. We'll jump right back in right after on this link. So, uh, I need a motion to uh, adjourn. Mr. Chairman. Mo yes. Motion. Make a motion to close the public hearing. Yes. Adjourn. Thank you. Support by Commissioner Brown. Okay. I have a motion by Carabelli. Support by Brown. To close the public hearing, please vote. Chair, that motion was to adjourn the meeting. It was to close the public hearing and adjourn the meeting. That that motion passes twelve to zero. Thank you. Now, Mike, is it uh, a pro? Are, are we ready to go? Can Veronica then jump right into a uh, finance meeting? Yes. Right. Commissioner Kleinfeld, the floor is yours. All right, I'll call this meeting to order. Please call the roll. Chair Smith. Chair Smith, voting remote or present remotely from Clinton Township, Macomb County, Michigan. Commissioner Duje. Uh, attending remotely from Warren, Michigan, Macomb County. Commissioner Sauger. Attending remotely from Centerline, Michigan. Commissioner Kleinfeld. Commissioner Kleinfeld attending remotely from East Point, Michigan. Commissioner Romano. Commissioner Romano attending remotely from Sterling Heights, Macomb County, Michigan. Commissioner Myjack. Commissioner Myjack remotely, Sterling Heights, Michigan, Macomb County. 
Commissioner Carabelli. Commissioner Carabelli, remotely, on away, Presque Isle County, Michigan. Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Brown attending remotely, Washington Township, Macomb County, Michigan. Commissioner Kraft. Commissioner Kraft attending remotely, Chesterfield Township, Macomb County, Michigan. Commissioner Lucido. Commissioner Leonetti. Commissioner Leonetti attending remotely from Mount Clemens, Michigan, Macomb County. Commissioner Haw. Commissioner Haw attending remotely, Roseville, Macomb County, Michigan. Commissioner Smith. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Drolette. Thank you. Commissioner Drolette attending remotely from Macomb Township, Macomb County, Michigan. And that completes, completes the roll. All right, please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I need a motion to adopt the agenda. Romano will adopt the agenda. Support Curabelli. All right, there's motion and support. Please vote. That motion passes 12 to 0. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item up is the public participation. And um, I, I think that the individual that wanted to speak before will definitely want to speak during this public participation. Anyone wish to be heard? Yes, uh, this is Jason with Sterling Heights. Um, I had a comment on item 6B. Um, not sure if you want to make comment now or if that item is pulled for discussion later. Yeah, no. Uh, go ahead and make the comment now and just um, state your name and address for the record. Okay. My name is Jason Castor, City Development Director with the City of Sterling Heights, 40555, Sterling Heights, Michigan. Um, comment is on the item 6B for funding for Macomb County Action Chore Program. Um, i just like to start out by uh, thanking you for allowing me to comment on this topic, and I also thank all of you for dedicating time and effort into resolving the funding gap that has been created. Um, I'd like to comment on what the elimination or the reduction of the service would mean for the senior population in Sterling Heights. Uh, Sterling Heights is a large population of, of seniors, uh, around 35% where a majority of these seniors are uh, 60 years and older. Cutting the chore program which services this population places them in a difficult situation, determining what to spend their income on. Uh, participants in this program have come to rely on this service and are most likely on a fixed income. And due to that fact, they may not have allocated any funds for the service, assuming it would, it would continue. Um, they could be placed in a difficult situation on now how to spend their money. City of Sterling Heights, uh, cannot manage this program. We do not have the staff or funding uh, support that would be needed to run this on our own. Uh, we can, can, however, continue to participate with uh, community development block grant funding as previously done in the amount of twenty-five to $30,000 per year. Um, increasing that, that participation amount with some of the other public, public services that we provide money to, like Wigs for Kids, Turning Point, Care House, um, at risk of eliminating those services if we had to increase that um, public service amount for the chore program. And that I would like to close and thank you again for considering increasing the funding to maintain this service at its current level to our senior population. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to be heard? Anyone else? If you're on the phone, hit star six. Anyone else wish to be heard? Seeing none, we'll close public participation. Department rec recommendations. So we've got the, um, can we do this? Yeah, we should change things around a little bit. So we've got the budget amendment, um, public safety payroll and capital improvement plan. Um, I guess I'll seek a motion. Motion by Hall. 
Is there support? By doing it. All right, Steve, I'm going to have you open up, and I, I, I know there's questions on this. I have questions. Are you yeah, there? Good yeah, I'm here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep, thank you. Good, thank you. Um, good afternoon again, commissioners. I, I think the the, uh, the budget amendment is fairly self-explanatory. What we're, we're trying to do here is essentially the, the same thing we're doing with um, other public safety payroll dollars that I mentioned uh, in my initial budget review a month or five weeks ago in that we were going to use that money to then um, provide funding for prepaying bonds or paying them off early and moving some money to uh, the capital projects fund. Essentially, sort of the same thing here. The concern here is that there are three projects that we were funding with or initially funding with CARES dollars where there are now some uh, potential time constraints on those projects being completed before the end of the year. So in order to mitigate and take out any risk of uh, the funding not being available for these projects through the CARES dollars, uh, we're proposing to fund public safety payroll in lieu of those, thereby creating more re new revenue or unanticipated revenue coming into the general fund transferring that revenue out then to the capital projects fund for these three projects. What was happening here was um, initially when guidance came out from the federal government relative to the CARES Act, it, there was some understanding that if a project was funded with CARES dollars, that the CARES dollars could be used to fund whatever portion of that project was completed by December 30th. So. For example, if a project was 90% completed, then you could charge those dollars to the CARES fund, and then you had to find, you know, the other 10% within other um, uh, areas of your budget. In October, late October, mid to late October, uh, U.S. Treasury came out with guidance that indicated that for a project to be eligible for CARES funding, it has to be fully completed and in service by the end of the year or none of the project costs are eligible. So a, a different, obviously, understanding than what we had before, thereby introducing, you know, a risk <clears throat> with these projects of not being completed by the end of the year of not having or not being able to use any CARES funding at all to fund any of the projects. So um, as you know, I've told you before, um, Public safety payroll is CARES eligible, even though it's in your budget already. You don't have to substantiate through time records or anything. Public safety employees or public health employees, for that matter, are substantially dedicated to responding to or mitigating the COVID crisis. It's just assumed uh, for administrative convenience that that is the case. So I will cut my comments at that and take any questions that you might have. All right. I don't have any other speakers, so I'm going to open up with this, Steve. Um, the first is, while we're doing the amendment for public safety, we're already committing that to three projects. What happens if the rules change again? <clears throat> what we're it's possible the rules could change again. I don't see it. It's so late in the game. There's only six weeks or five weeks left before December 30th. I think Treasury has probably made their final decisions on, on their funding sources. This whole idea of um, funding public safety payroll went back and forth. It's pretty solidified. There was, from what I understand, quite a bit of pushback from um, municipalities and organizations like the Government Finance Office Association to um, make those dollars available for funding in this, primarily because when the initial guidance came out from Treasury in July, it said, oh, you could just presume that public safety payroll was dedicated to um, uh, the COVID response. Folks like the state of Michigan, for example, went down that path and started making budgetary decisions both for 2020 and 2021 under that guidance. Then Treasury reversed course 
and that would have substantially changed what the state was doing, in my opinion. And there was a lot of pushback. So then Treasury came back and revised their guidance. I don't see them revising guidance in such a drastic way so late in the game at this point. Okay, so this is a 2020 budget amendment. It is. And, and and there are projects in this budget amendment that haven't even started. Correct? One. The the joint information center. So the so, likelihood of that getting done in this budget is low anyway, isn't it? We will well, in terms of it being completed, yes. But what we're doing is much like we do with other capital projects, we are sending the money from the general fund to the capital projects fund for the entire project budget when it's approved. And that's what we do with what we've done the last couple of years in the non-departmental capital outlay. Right. One, one part of this is somewhat urgent, and that's the part with respect to the, um, well, there's a couple that's urgent because we're in the middle of the project with the medical examiners, so that makes it somewhat urgent. The budget amendment with regard to public safety is urgent because that has to take place now, correct? Correct. Okay, so <clears throat> um, a couple of questions. Has the board voted on and we've been doing so many CARES things, I apologize for not knowing this, but have we voted on any aspect of the um, media center? Hi. Hi. Yeah, Vicki's on. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Commissioner Kleinfeld. Um, the JIC Media Center project, the board did approve the contract with Partners in Architecture. Um, to do the design and, and release the bids. And then um, I'm not sure where it's in the process on your end, but the approval request to award the contract to our recommended contractor from the bid process, um, I believe is um, in the BOC office through Civic Clerk. I don't know if it's been assigned to an agenda or not for uh, this month's meeting. Okay, and then Steve, with respect to the medical examiner's office, um, was what we approved um, with construction art and architectural and then everything, was that more like closer to 3.8 than it was to 5.2? The project, but you got, I think, 3.2 for construction. It was somewhere in that neighborhood, but you also have a contingency budget for 700,000-ish uh, in that budget. So that's part of this. Um, so that would bring it up to? 5.2, and then there's other things so like permit. Would, there's like permitting fees and site well, reviews. and. Aren't those all in there when we approve it? Are they not no. separate? No, you, you approved architectural, uh, construction for construction only. Uh, you approved owner's representative with Plant Man Cressa, mm -hmm. but there are with the city of Mount Clemens that are mm -hmm. under $35,000. they are uh, yeah, don't aren't those usually built into the cost of a contract? Not uh, for the contract. No, we, we it's only for the contract or the construction, not all the ancillary costs. It's built into the project budget, but not necessarily the construction contract. Okay, so that gets you to 4.5, and so you're telling me from 4.5 to 5.2, 700,000 is, is permits and things that wouldn't be in the contract, and the That's contingency true. would be in the contract. Wouldn't the contingency no. be? There's a, conti there's a contingency for the construction built into the contract. Then there's another contingency. I think in this case it's around 15% for other anticipated delays or might have environmental issues, just a general contingency overall. So, so we, we hire an architect and um, a construction manager, so to say, speaker, construction. And inside of that, we build in a cost overrun contingency. And I have never heard of what you're telling me today, which is then there's another 
15% of contingency that we don't ever approve on every project and everything's under if you if, if if we need to utilize it and purchase some items and all those things that would be subject to the purchasing and contracting order you would see them i think i mark is going on but isn't yeah. that kind of how you get uh in, isn't that how you have a a, a huge cost overrun in a project if you have say say 20 items that are under 35,000 isn't that how that happens I see you Mark but, if you want to speak to hi. us hi uh, yes thank you um, I, I don't have those contracts in front of me right now but um, part of what we're experiencing out there is um, it's something we, we, we uh, call general conditions and there's money built that's general conditions is separate from a contingency general conditions goes to um, rent um, construction trailers if we need it in this case in the medical examiner's office um, we are renting um, some trailers that operate as coolers uh, because while we're going through this transition and adding space uh, um, um, storage space cooling storage for bodies um, we are renting some additional uh, trailers we just found out about a week and a half ago um, that Dr. Spitz has informed us that because of the uptick in, uh, in COVID and increase in deaths over and above um, the deaths that, you know, the county, uh, the deaths that already go through the morgue, um, we need the trailers here a little bit longer. Like, we thought we were only going to need them through the end of December, but now all of January, all that we have out there right now. So that could be part of it. Um, um, uh, Commissioner Kleinfeld, I'm not sure because, again, I don't have those individual uh, professional service contracts in front of me. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Aha. Thank you, Chair. Steve, I've noticed on here there's an MCA freezer renovation. I thought I saw on the news last week with the anticipation of a vaccine that they were going to require very high, uh, low temperature freezers to the tune that we were going to have to purchase somewhere between somewhere between seven and ten, and they were talking ninety thousand, if not more, a piece. Where is that? I, I'm hoping that's under CARES Act money. One. And two, where would that fall on anybody's budget, since this was not anticipated at all? So those two separate items, two completely different topics, Commissioner Haw. So the freezer project at MCA is for the expansion of food storage, and the board has approved the purchase of the freezer unit itself, as well as the construction. We had to lay a cement slab and all that sort of thing. So that project is in process as well. What you're speaking about is purchasing freezers to store the vaccines, as you indicated. Those items will be coming to you this week um, from Vicki. Um, so those those are in the process of being purchased. Okay, and my assumption that that will be under CARES Act money, is that a good assumption? Yes. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you. I don't see any other speakers, so please vote. Is Mike Keys on? Yep, I did prompt it, but the uh, system is just taking a minute, so should be seen on your screen shortly here. That motion passes 12 to 0. Thank you. All right. So then we get down to the budget amendments. And the first one is the animal control. So I got to pull up the memo that I got today. And um, that was from Vicki, correct? Yeah. Yeah. 
It was from Vicki, and I think it was forwarded to me by Steve, and that was where my confusion on that came in. Okay, so I, I read the memo, and I understand the issues with regarding us just saying, listen, we're going to fund all of these things. So, um, and before that came in, I was trying to figure out a number because my thought process is I know what I'm doing isn't the fix. I know that. The problem is it's been three years now, and there it, it's kind of coming clear to me that there probably isn't going to be a fix the way that there should be or the way that I think that there should be. So I felt I have an obligation to do something with respect to those communities, not necessarily cover 100%, but give them some sort of some sort of understanding that they're part of the county too in, with respect to this. My question with regard to your memo is it didn't mention Sterling Heights, and I know Sterling Heights has a, a contract, and I know they have a cost associated with this, and I don't know how to calculate that one. Um, do you know? I don't, I know Jeffrey and Dazzle's on as well, but um, with um, the service contracts for where it's just services, which Sterling Heights is one that just gets service, the service piece because they have their own um, city provided officers. I don't know that there's a dollar amount um, actually put in the contract um, and in the memo, at, at least, when you look at the funding from 17, 18, and 19, I guess you could say that's the amount of their contract. Um, I don't think we put it down. I meant St. Clair Shores because it's not in here, and they actually have a contract with an officer. So I don't know how their, their cost with respect to this is calculated or if they're paying a cost with respect to housing the animals. I'm sorry, if I said Sterling Heights, I meant St. Clair Shores. And Jeff probably does know the answer to that. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. So to answer your question, it sounds like you're asking um, for St. Clair Shores that they're not on this memo. And it's because we are focused on those four contractual cities. So we're... But St. Clair Shores pays a cost of some sort, do they not? So I was trying to get, trying to look at every community that's paying for something that the other communities aren't paying for. I, so, I, go ahead. So sorry, Vicki, go ahead. Sorry. I think the St. Clair Shores contract is around 90000 90000 yeah. or so, what they yeah. pay. That's correct. Yeah. Um. Jeff, that ninety thousand is that for the officer in the vehicle, or does that cover this cost as well? It also um, was put into there to cover some of the cost of their boarding. So I know when Pete Provenzano had done the contract years ago, they had taken into consideration a lot of that aspect of it. So, do they pay any fees in the boarding and the dropping off of like dead animals and things? Do they pay anything else? They do not. They pay like a monthly fee. As Vicki said, it's almost 90000 Okay. And that I know about, I believe it's 88000 Right. All right. So what, and the reason I haven't sought a motion is I kind of wanted to ration, rationalize this out with you guys. I absolutely understand your memo and the issues regarding it. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to, do a budget amendment that says we're going to cover all these costs for these people because that's not possible and I know it. What I was more in line with thinking, I do a budget amendment. Um, uh, this has got this is like seventy eight, and I was thinking, um, like maybe a, another so, some thousands um, with respect to St. Clair Shores, and it's it's just sort of a a rebate off of the bill that they pay. I don't have a set amount for each community because, as you're right, number one, they 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 fluctuate. And what I don't want to do is 
set aside ten thousand for each point, and each point's cost are only four thousand, so we just gave them six thousand dollars. I was more thinking about doing a budget amendment to put money into your account where you would be able to look at the communities and sort of figure out how much of a rebate each one of those communities. It doesn't fix anything, but it just tells those communities it's on our radar and we know that this is happening and, and we're trying to help out this way. What do you think about that? I guess I would have to understand it more because for me, um, when I'm thinking about it, is the way I'm taking it is that you're going to give us just say $60,000, right, into the animal control budget. And that would help subsidize some of the cost that those four communities are spending every year for their animals that they bring to us. Is that correct? Uh, yes, but I think it would have to subsidize a part of St. Clair Shores, maybe a small part. So maybe you, you bill them, um, uh, you know, 80, 85,000 instead of 88, depending on what you look at and what you evaluate. I don't want to tell you what to bill each community. I'm just, I was just thinking this was a temporary fix this year that would give you, to, you guys time to consider, to continue to evaluate and figure out a way to fix the inequity. And I, I feel like I've been promising those areas for a long time that I'm addressing this and I haven't done anything to address it. And there's a lot of hard feelings. So that's what my thought process was. I, I, I'm not trying to force anything on anybody. That's why I wanted to know what you and Vicki think about it. Yeah, I think for me, I think is, you know, using that money to subsidize, it would be a bigger conversation for uh, Vicki and I, but as long as it didn't obligate the animal control division in any way of taking on more animals. Does that make no, sense? No, not only would it not do that, it wouldn't obligate you to do this in the future. This is a one-time allotment this year that we could say to East Point, we have good news for you. Uh, we're going to credit you this much on your bill. Um, for this year, um, uh, it would only obligate you that money for those communities for this year and nothing more. So, Vicki, what do you think about that? Um, Just to clarify, so you want to put more money into animal control's budget on the expense side. Your it, budget uh, amendment would give them more money expenditure-wise. It, it does, and that's not how I wanted to fix it. I wanted to fix it by more revenue, but those conversations aren't moving forward. And um, I don't know how to get them to move forward. It was, this, was, this first came up, I believe, before we were in... Um, before we were in, the very first time it came up, I think, is before we were even in that building. Um, we were across the street where that when we were getting renovated, but it came up again more strongly about three years ago. And and I know I know that um, I think uh, Executive Delton was also somebody that was working on this, and I think a whole lot of things happened in between. But even before COVID. It sat dormant for a couple of years, and, and, and I feel like I have to provide something because I feel like we, we're at the south end paying for everybody else's services, and i got to find a way to, to rectify that. So I'm, what I'm saying is not that you spend more money, but that you don't build those communities what you as much as you would build them. You give them a bit of a break because the residents in those communities have been paying for everybody else's um, services up there for years and years and years. And at some point, we have to stop taking money from those communities so that other communities can have something for free that they have to pay for. We can't do that. So, so for the money, so say the sixty thousand, would that be something that they would those four cities would utilize for the fiscal year of two thousand twenty one, and say here's you know x amount to help 
for you in 2000? I think what it would be is you don't give them the money. I think when they're paying a bill, you take a percentage off of that bill. I think that would be the likely scenario. Well, I like the approach of giving the money to the department to use as reimbursement rather than direct payments to the communities, obviously. Um, that's, you know, that's a, a, a better approach. All right, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, and I, I'm going to call on Commissioner Gillette. And Vicki, do you want to speak? Yes, I did, but I can wait if you want. I can go next, or uh, go ahead. Why don't you go ahead, and then I'll call on Commissioner Gillette. Sure. Um, I, I get the concept, and I think we all know that somewhat this this isn't the great all the way around, and that yes, we've been dealing with it for years. Um, Based on the new, your new idea and, and concept, I'll say two things. One, I think if we just give a discount in the beginning, we may run into the same problem that let's say they know their discount is $10,000. We still run into the issue that they're going to use that $10,000 and have the potential to bring us more animals than they normally do because they have the $10,000 for free. Um, you know, we can come back if you wanted and with the plan and I get what Commissioner Brown saying is with time frame um, or I guess to offer something up um, I mean we're at the end of this fiscal year we already know what their numbers are you know we could potentially give a, a discount off of 2020 I don't know if that's possible Steve um, but just because that's the numbers we know. Uh, again, there's a fear that if they know there's a discount, they start bringing us more animals. We could get um, overloaded again just based on, um, and maybe not even necessarily personnel initially, but capacity. Um, and we'd have to turn them away. So those were just my two thoughts that I wanted to bring forward. Okay, and yeah, it certainly doesn't have to be based on percentages. Um, let me call on Commissioner Gillette. Thank you, Chair. Um, I understand your uh, long-term frustration on this issue and the perceived injustice, which I think is, is, is warranted. Um, but I'm a little uncomfortable essentially allocating funds, whether it's a discount or direct money, without identifying where that money would otherwise come from. So I would hope that um, perhaps something could be worked out where we could identify if we are going to do something financially, you know, where the money would be then taken from. So that's just my broad concern, um, and I understand your frustration. So it's not really a question, just a statement. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gillette. I mean, the only the only option I have is is the fund equity because we're not charging the communities that that could offset that cost. We're not charging them anything. So that was the original intent, was to create a revenue stream. And, and that hasn't happened yet. I haven't given up on that. So I don't have any other commissioners. Um, so Vicki. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to approve. All right. So there's a move to approve a $60,000. Um, budget amendment into animal control from, um, I don't have a line item, it would end up being the fund equity. Um, is there support? Okay. Support. Okay, there's I'll support. A All right, there's a motion in support. And Vicki, what, what you could do is you don't have to make a plan on what to do with this money right now just because we're doing this you could do exactly what you said you could regroup and come back and say this is how we we plan on allocating it or this is what we think is the best or fairest way to address this situation this doesn't give you a mandate to do anything because it isn't ultimately it's not our budget to mandate you to do that anyway does that make sense to you yes Okay. All right. Thank you. And with that, please. Vote.
That motion passes with commissioners. I'm sorry. That motion passes 10 to 2 with commissioners Romano and Drolet voting no. Okay, and there's no time frame for you guys, Vicki, on your end on how you want to handle this. And, and any ideas you have are perfectly fine with me. I feel like I've done something, and th that's pretty much the gist of it, okay? Understood. Yeah, I think Steve wants to say Commissioner something. Commissioner Kleinfeld? Sorry. Yes. So what, is the, what, are, what are the mechanics of the budget amendment? You, you indicated you're going to well, move I, money. I understand what you're saying. So it's got to come out of a line item. But ultimately, at the end of our budget, we've got money that isn't being used, correct? So, so we can work out the mechanics because we're only forwarding to full board. So we can work out the mechanics. Okay, because when I... Only because when I hear moving money into the budget, that means increasing expenses. But earlier in the conversation, I heard really what we're what you are looking for is a reduction in revenue. It, that's that's really kind of how it would uh, how it would work. Yeah, that like makes okay. So you're reducing revenue and increasing the usage of fund balance. I'm just getting into the technical terms. I don't want to bore everybody with that. But I think I wanted. To give Vicki the latitude, though, whatever we end up doing, that it can change to accommodate how she wants to do it. So, okay. so we'll come up with the mechanics for the full board meeting, but it can be subject to change based on how she wants to accomplish what we're thinking about doing. Okay. Okay? Thank you. All right. <laughs> I knew that that one was going to be a bear. Commissioner Haas said you look stressed. Yes, I, w I was stressed. <laughs> so we'll, with that, we go on to, let's see where we are. Um, uh, we've done, oh, we didn't do B and C. They're going to come together, I think. Um, uh, B is funded from, for Macomb Community Action. Let's see, what's the, so I'm going to seek a motion um, for these two items which are tied to together which are regarding the chore program in Macomb County. Do you want a motion to approve? Is that what you're looking for, Madam Chair? Yeah, I'm looking for a motion, and I believe based on the discussion and workshop, that that motion would be um, to transfer um, 380000 from the MSU extension and it into um, Macomb Community Action. No, I'll make so that motion, Commissioner Romano. Support. Support to Roulette. And again, any technicalities, Steve, we can fix before full board. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Commissioner yes. Law, if I may, I had raised the question I didn't want to solve one problem with creating another. Uh, it's my understanding that JP and Ed Scott are both on the line. I would like to get a definitive answer from one or both on how this would impact the MSU program. Okay. JP? Chairwoman Kleinfeld, thank you uh, for the opportunity and uh, commissioners very much appreciate the um, uh, interest in examining how we can expand the scope of all the pro programs underneath health and community services. Uh, the discussion that was brought to our attention is that the Board of Commissioners is considering an allocation of upwards of 380000 that would go to subsidize the chore program loss that we obtained with the lack of funding that's coming in from the Area Agency of Aging 1B. Um, ultimately, with the $520,000 allocation, this would take away more than 80% of the funding that goes to the collective programs under the umbrella of Michigan State University Extension. And as Ernest Covey itemized a little bit earlier with the conversations in your workshop, would drastically impact a lot of the financial services program and direct assistance that we've been giving to vulnerable populations as they go through those in financial empowerment courses and even um, uh, the home ownership elements on that side too. Uh, I've got Ed Scott on the line here too that very much can give an overview of a lot of those programs and undertakings that we facilitate, but uh, ultimately um, uh, we're here to answer any questions that you may have 
with regards to the impact that this would undoubtedly have on MSUE and ultimately a little bit of the organizational wrangling that we'll have to do to um, uh, backfill and look at additional funding sources in those arenas too. Madam um, Chair. Oh, yeah. this, this is I don't know if, if I, can everybody see me and hear me? Yes. Okay, I, if I may, um, I, I'd just like to just add on to what JP just shared. First of all, thank you all very much. Good afternoon and thank you for taking the time to listen to us. I just wanna throw out there that uh, on average, every year, MSU Extension serves approximately between 30 to 35,000 Macomb County residents, many of whom are also seniors who benefit from our nutrition and health and physical activity programs, as well as foreclosure counseling um, and financial literacy uh, workshops. Um, we, you know, through the budgeting process for FY21, we found ways to comply with the request from finance for uh, reductions um, right around in the area of five to six percent um, and there's really not much left to cut uh, except for staff at this point point. and so i just want to reiterate um, a, a cut that size would severely severely impede our ability to continue to provide services to macomb residents so thank you for your consideration Thank you, Commissioner Gillette. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that a cut of the size which uh, would reduce the appropriation of 889,000 from the proposed 1.26 million approximately would impact MSU extensions um, staff inability to provide the services they provide. Um, However, I don't believe it is, you know, the, uh, my job at least, to look to protect um, staff jobs as much as it is to provide the most essential services uh, to uh, the residents of Macomb County. Uh, what we have is uh, a program, uh, a proposal before us, uh, to restore funding to essentially largely disabled and low-income seniors who need essential services to stay in their homes. Uh, when we had the, when I previously addressed the MSU extension uh, service two years ago during the budget presentation, as many of you recall, we had a fair number of folks, about 30 to 40 folks that showed up and, and talked about the, the value they received from MSU extension. But the great majority of those people who came forward discussed the 4-H program, they discussed the Master Gardener program, uh, there's a lot of programs provided by MSU Extension that are not about financial stability or nutrition programs. Uh, those programs, whether they're 4-H or Master Gardener, are not needs-based. Uh, they are not, um, uh, they are not um, helping a low-income person uh, or a disabled person stay in their home. I've seen the work that MSU Extension does. I worked a number of years at a nursery here in Macomb County. And MSU Extension did a great job. They would come in and make presentations on treating diseases for roses, um, other things like that, uh, that were good programs. But we have to make tough choices. And the tough choices we have to make are, are we going to allocate money to uh, non-essential services and end services to disabled seniors who are having difficulty staying in their homes who are very low income. Sometimes we have to make choices. I am uncomfortable allocating any new funding without identifying where we pay for it. I do not want to create a new entitlement program, but I'm willing to help out if we can identify where we get that money from. Yes, MSU Extension does provide services. Yes, there are county employees that there are there. But where can we best allocate the, where government is supposed to help? The people who are most needy. And we're not eliminating MSU extension. They can prioritize uh, with the administration which services they feel help the most vulnerable people that they do. And that is gonna mean cutting back some things that are nice. But if the decision is made between prioritizing there or prioritizing helping the needy, the disabled, and the people who are most struggling, those are the people I have to prioritize. So that's why I offered this amendment and I Appreciate your letting me speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Jesus. Uh, uh, 
frankly, I'm surprised that we're going after uh, item three on this uh, versus uh, investigating the CDBG funds, both that the cities get and that the county gets. Um, the need based as far as uh, my colleague just expressed is, is very nice and heart rendering, but this is more age based than anything else. Um, uh, if you attended AAA one B meetings, uh, it's probably going. They're going bananas because they had to cut this also. Uh, my question is, why wasn't number one uh, the CDBG uh, funding? Was that uh, looked at? Was that investigated? Who was doing that, and when did they do that? I can answer that because we discussed it during our budget workshop at two. This dollar amount, and by the way, I'm going to touch back on that, uh, the problem with the budget later, but this dollar amount was only for this year, and it was because the communities had already made the commitments for their CDBG in other areas, and they had already held their public hearings and had already moved forward with that. So it kind of made it impossible to backtrack on that. So that was just for this year. To sustain it in the future, it was more like $200,000. Uh, is, is AAA-1B looking at the funding in future dollars, for future dollars? I think they're out, aren't they, Steve? Um, to, to clarify the AAA funding source, um, it is still coming to Macomb County but it can't be used for continuous such as routine snow or grass cutting. So the AAA dollars are still there. They just repurpose them, and they are no longer eligible for grass and snow. So we are setting up a new handy helper program, which can help with one-time chore services for seniors or disabled residents. But the, the regular chore funding will be used for that uh, non-continuous chore service. So it hasn't gone away. It is still there but we don't see any signal that it will be able to be used for the previously eligible purpose for the continual grass and snow service. All right. Um, uh, thank you for that explanation, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not comfortable with cutting uh, MSU extension funds for this, although I understand the reason for it uh, and the background to it. Uh, I don't agree with it, and I think we can find uh, at least $200,000 someplace else. I will be voting against this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Ha. Thank you, Madam Chair. JP, did I hear you say with a reduction of this magnitude it could reach a level of an 80% reduction in services under the MSU Extension Program? I, I would have to agree with, again, I'm saying it, my colleague Leon, that if we're talking about rose growing and as, uh, there was horseback riding or equestrian, something or other, those are not as high a priority as taking care of the disabled and the seniors. So what are we talking about? with this reduction in budget, I heard Ed Scott's explanation. I'd like to hear yours as well. Yes, uh, Commissioner Hall. So ultimately the MSUE contractual budget for 2021 is slated at $520,000. Ultimately the 380,000 reduction would be uh, uh, subtracted from there. Clearly, as you've itemized here and as Commissioner Drolet highlighted, there is no one that is sitting back here saying that vulnerable seniors don't need services. Ultimately, the only thing that myself and Mr. Scott are itemizing here is that there is cross-programming and synergies between not only the MCA apparatus that provides direct financial assistance to vulnerable individuals, but also training support and program synergies that go across all those arenas. There's those wraparound services, there is ability for us to triage on all those financial empowerments, and a cut of this magnitude will undoubtedly completely alter the landscape and the way that we partner with Ed and his entire team at MSUE. Clearly, this is a judgment call that the Board of Commissioners has the ability to make. This late in the budget process, we undoubtedly would work with Ed, Ernest, and the entire team under HNCS 
to illustrate the impact that this would have. But again, this is just something that we hope that the board would bring for consideration and explore other funding arenas where this could happen. Well, I appreciate that suggestion and I heard Commissioner Duje say the same thing. Um, and our decisions are to prioritize, but creating one problem to solve another problem is not the way that I think we go about prioritizing. Um, I do agree with Leon and Romano that we need to find a way to fund the uh, MCA and the Chores Act fund uh, uh, programs so that we don't have our most vulnerable uh, sitting out there wondering how snow is going to get shoveled and grass is going to get cut. So I guess my challenge to Commissioner Drulet, who's very, very good at this, is where could we find $200,000 elsewhere? So thank you for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Romano. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, we have MSU extension program right now. As a, I, I'm going to quote, and I'm not sure I'm totally correct, a million two in our budget. And we're talking about 380 removing it as a one time because the other uh, CBD uh, money has been spent by the municipalities. But I say again, municipalities, this money that we're allocating is not for, and people keep saying that it's for Sterling Heights. It's not. It's for all of us. It's for all of our communities. And this chore program is not limited to snow removal and grass. Don't forget, we have a lot of seniors that need other work done on their properties that can't afford to do it because their income doesn't justify it. So when I hear that it's cutting uh, $520,000, uh, the, the numbers don't add up. We're talking about a million two or a million three at MSU taking, uh, they're still going to have approximately $989,000 left. So we're talking a one-time cut this time, this year for 2021 of 380 because the other money has been spent by the CBG municipalities. And then we're talking $200,000 for 2022. And again, let's take one year at a time. Nobody knows what 2022 is going to bring us. We might have to eliminate all these programs. But the money is there for now. I think MSU can afford this 380 as a one-time hit and then go on from there. Again, it's prioritizing what is necessary. It's, it's a need, not a want. And, and I'm very firm about that. So uh, keeping in line with uh, Commissioner Hall and Commissioner Droletta said, it's, it's a need and it's not a want. And I think that uh, the people in our communities, especially the seniors, the, uh, the dis disabled and the limited income uh, deserve that from us. And if it's a matter of giving it to them or giving it to MSU, my choice is clear. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And before I call on Commissioner Brown, I will want to get the, the budget clarification. Uh, the 305 is, um, is internal services. So that's basically, Steve, that's money we put in there and we take out of there to pay our own costs, correct? Right, correct. So, so that um, doesn't count towards there. So now we're up to the um um I, I don't have I don't have any questions. I just want to get clarification before I call Commissioner Brown, because I'm I'm in line to speak or yeah. Okay, so so that brings us down to the 545 and the 397, but John Paul is saying the whole thing is 500 something. So do you guys have any clarification on the explanation between? Yes. Okay, thank you. So within that 545,000 is 520,000 for the contract with MSU Extension. The remainder of that budget is office supplies and postage. I'm not sure what else is in there. But anyway, <clears throat> the lion's share of that 545 is the, the contract with MSU. You have 305,000 for internal services. That's allocations for indirect costs and phones and liability insurance. So <clears throat> that's really kind of off the table, as you indicated, Commissioner Kleinfeld. And then the remainder of the budget is, almost, is personnel. I think I don't have the page in front of me. I want to say, based on my earlier recollection, about three hundred and eighty-seven thousand of personnel costs. Three ninety-seven. Three ninety-seven. So that's for the five folks. That's their salaries and their benefits. So we could, you know, I don't want to sound harsh, but you know, if you took it out of there, you know, I'm not saying we get, you know, control kind of where you you take it from. 
But for all intents and purposes, short of laying off five folks, the money would have to come from the MSU contract, for all intents and purposes, in my mind. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I think we've set ourselves up in a position that the tour program is very valuable. and We need to fund it and because and, it helps all of us and it provides a high value of service to a, to a special population that we all care about. So that's, that's the given. The choice of picking MSU extension, an old fool of some people, um, it doesn't sound like it's going to be very workable without going the whole program and, uh, and that provides needed services uh, for our community that, uh, as well. So let's look at other areas of our budget where we could take this money for a one-time uh, expenditure. Bricks and mortar. We could take money out. We could take $380,000 or whatever the dollar amount is exactly out of the capital fund. We don't need to build every year in the capital fund. We have excess money that isn't spent that's programmed to be spent. And I think that that would be a way for us to pull the money out fund the needed program that's uh, necessary, the tourist service program, without having to gut another also equally valuable program. And um, and that way nothing would be cut, and there's plenty of money in that capital fund um, that we could uh, pull out uh, to do a uh, to redirect to our general fund budget. And it's only a sliver in that fund anyway. And uh, we could forgo a brick or two uh, if we actually needed it this year to take care of our needed seniors. That's what I would suggest we do. Um, but I'm interested in what my colleagues think. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Thank Chairwoman. Commissioner Kraft. Thank you, Madam Chair. Two real quick questions for clarification. The exact dollar amount and if it's the whole county or not for the chores program. Whoever wants to answer. The exact amount is 380000 for this year and uh, for this upcoming year, and that would cover all the communities that currently get the service. Okay. I think that's all. I believe that's every community. Yeah, that would be the whole county. Okay, good. Thank you. Now to Steve, in terms of the contract with MSU, how does that work? Do we have to provide a certain amount of money and Michigan State provides a certain amount of money or how Ed's shaking his head? <laughs> Am I close to something here? Yeah, if if I may. Um, so the way the way that budget administration agreement works is uh, we have a set dollar amount that we ask for from the county every year. Um, we're currently uh, at five. 140,000, we use those dollars as an investment. So we invest in MSU Extension staff who provide a lot of the programs and services that we provide here, but that also provides access to the vast network of expertise and educational resources that are available from the university, you know, statewide. And so between those additional resources, the operating dollars that we pour into Macomb County, the, uh, the, the business that we give to local vendors through our various events and things like that, um, that $540,000, give or take a few, um, is really an investment that results in about two and a half to three million dollars of revenue back into the county each year. And I, I just want to, um, I guess, if I can offer another point of clarity, you know, MSU Extension is multifaceted, and many of our most visible programs, I'm thinking about our 4-H program that works with youth, and our Master Gardener program, you know, that deals with horticulture and, and lawn problems, those those don't feel very needs-based. I understand that. They're, they're nice to have, but not need to have programs, right? I think we can acknowledge that. They're, they're great resources, um, but they're not needs-based. But we offer several other services that are needs-based. We work with, I don't know, anywhere between 10 to 15,000 Macomb County residents every year on the basis of need to provide education for SNAP and FNAP recipients um, around, you know, building a healthy lifestyle, how to make those resources last 
so that, you know, they're not constantly coming back to food banks and back to, you know, loan institutions and things like that. Um, we do a significant number of residents uh, and help them in terms of walking them through the tax foreclosure process every year uh, through our partnership with the county treasurer. And many of those people that we work with, we're able to find additional funds for them through step forward dollars or through helping them work through a budgeting process uh, in order to get the dollars back into the county so that those people get to stay in their homes. Um, the SNAP and FNAP recipients that we work with, many of those are elderly people um, who we also serve. And so please understand, we fully, fully acknowledge and agree with the idea that our seniors and our vulnerable populations have to be served and are, in fact, a priority. Um, I just want to make sure everybody understands that we serve those people as well. And, you know, this, this type of a reallocation of our funds would make that almost impossible. Thanks, Ed. Madam Chair, one more question, if I might. Ed, since I still have you here. In terms of Michigan State's commitment, is there a financial commitment from them, or is it the name and the program that comes from them? I'm just curious if there's a way that MSU, if they are give some financial dollars, if they could crank it up a little bit for a year. I'm just curious, just throwing it out there. Uh, you know, the short answer to that is no. <laughs> um, you know, the longer answer is we're in the same boat as everybody else in terms of the way that our finances have been affected by uh, COVID-19 and the cuts that we've had to take. Our funding is based on dollars we get from the state level and from the feds. And so, you know, we've seen tremendous cuts there. Um, a, a cut of this size this year, that's not something that we can make up for or accommodate. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate yeah. the answers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I'm going to skip down because not everybody's been heard. Um, um, I will say on my turn, um, when you remove the internal um, services, it's clear that it is cutting really deep in one area, and I know it's an area that uh, Commissioner Gillette has had his eyes on for a while, um, but I think that we really should look at um, other avenues rather than hitting one entity with everything. I think it is too deep of a cut. So with that, I'm going to call on Commissioner Carabelli. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have two questions. If somebody could uh, shortly answer them. Number one, uh, it was just explained that there's a lot of federal cuts and state cuts um, that I'm unaware of to uh, MSU extension. That's the first question. I'd like to know what those dollars are and what programs were eliminated from those cuts. Then the next question I have, during the COVID, and during it's going on now, and we're locked down again, all these uh, programs um, for the children, the 4-H, the, the booze crews, all the different stuff, did those even happen this year because of the COVID? So if somebody can answer those two questions, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, so um, one just point of clarity, um, there is no booze crews. Uh, we offer an educational program on Lake St. Clair that highlights the history of uh, bootlegging and takes participants along some of those old routes to, to help them learn about Michigan's history. Um, but it's not a booze cruise in the traditional sense, and there's no alcohol um, allowed on the boat. We don't participate in those kinds of things. Um, I do not have an exact dollar amount from our state and federal um, uh, numbers to give you, but I can certainly get that for you, and I'd be happy to provide that to you. Uh, we've spent the last uh, seven months or so, or however long we've been in lockdown, really focused on working to bring all of our resources, as many as possible, into an online and virtual environment. Um, wherever we've been able to do so, we have. There are some programs, including the, the foreclosure mitigation programs we discussed, that um, that do still have to work through some, you know, face-to-face -face interactions with precautions. But uh, on the whole, almost all of our programs have been taken into an online format, and we've actually seen an increase in the participation in them because of that. Chair Kleinfeld, I also want to highlight, too, that Michigan State University Extension was one of the first partners to actually step up and highlight the importance of mental health throughout the pandemic and provided inventive programming at the outset, and they continue to be one of the most sterling and reputable partners that we have in our family resource centers, too. 
Thank you. Are you done, Commissioner Caravelli? Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Commissioner Ha. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think what we've identified here is exactly what I was fearful of. We are solving one problem by creating another. Uh, the MSU extension program has been identified by the gentleman on talking to us is an important want or need. It's not a desire. So the CHARS program it is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I know many Roosevelt seniors use it, up to and including my late mother. So why don't we look at, instead of taking it from the MSU extension program, I know Schmigel hates these kind of questions, but he's going to get it anyways. We are going to have excess dollars in the fund balance at the end of the year. It's going to be there. So if, why not take the money from the fund balance? You can't expect the MSU extension people to eliminate, and, I, and I'll repeat it again, JP said 50% of the services they supply. And in this taking it out of the fund balance, even if we do it for a one time, one year, allows JP to go back to the local municipalities and talk to them about their CBDG funding moving forward. So I'd like to make a counter motion, Madam Chair, if I can, that we direct Steve Schmigel. Well, what? I think what we would do is there's been an amendment on uh, a motion to amend the budget. So I think. Well, what I'm offering is a secondary suggestion that allows both programs to be applicable this next budgetary year. It allows CBDG conversations with the local municipalities, and both objectives are accomplished. So how do we get to that procedurally? Okay, so in I... order, Madam Chairwoman. Yes. <laughs> I think he's offering a substitute motion. If it's accepted, I'll support it. Okay, so the motion is going to be whether or not, it, first of all, I haven't done a substitute motion. I've done an amendment on the original motion. So would you care to explain, Commissioner Brown? I know the friendly amendments that we did before were not proper. So uh, so are you saying we got to do a motion on whether or not he can do a substitute motion? Because I was going to offering He's offering a substitute motion that by a majority vote of the board, will be accepted to offer a substitute motion, and then the motion will be voted on up or down. If it fails, then we'll go back to the original motion on, on the floor. All right, where's our parliamentarian, Crystal? See, mm -hmm. I, I was going to say that's a, an amendment to Commissioner Gillette's motion, and if the amendment passed, then the, uh, the original motion would become Commissioner Haas. That's how I was going to handle it. I understand so he, you think that, feel that wait, way. Wait, However, wait, Don, I'm talking it, to our parliamentarian. Oh, yes. The, we have the one. Substitute. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so he can amend the motion on the floor by um, you striking out words and replacing them, or if he wants to replace the entire motion, it would be a substitute motion. So it. Commissioner Ha, is he change? What part is he changing? I'm changing where the funding comes from. So and he's making a motion. He's making a, a substitute motion that the funding will come from fund equity as, instead of MSU extension. Okay, then we could just amend the motion That's for that portion. Okay, that's where I was going. So, so, so Commissioner Haas making an amendment to the original motion that uh, the money comes out of fund equity instead of MSU extension. We do have two more speakers before we would vote on that, but I need support for his amendment. Support of the amendment, Commissioner Romano. Okay, we have uh, we got a motion and support by Leonetti, and I'm going to call on uh, Commissioner Brown. 
I'll pass. I'll support the motion. It, it makes sense taking it from fund balance. We've got plenty of money there in a one-time uh, uh, arrangement. I think that uh, takes care of a problem and funds a, a needed program and doesn't um, destroy another valuable program. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Commissioner Gillette. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, Kraft, did you, Commissioner Kraft, did you speak on this yet? Once I did, yes. Okay, then Commissioner Gillette. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I posed the previous uh, agenda item because it took money, it appropriated money without identifying its source. The source is always going to be fund balance. We're, you know, unfortunately, a one-time thing, as we know, oftentimes doesn't stay a one-time thing. When you Taking a program away, even the booze cruise, which she denies exists, but it's from their literature and described in their literature as such, uh, you can't, it's very difficult to take a program away. I pose this motion because it doesn't identify a true source of where the money's come from other than the fund balance. I realize that is a source of money, but it's not, uh, it, it's further, you know, eroding our financial position. Um, I would challenge, however, some of the statements made um, by some of the previous speakers that removing $380,000 from MSU extension would be, you know, a 50% or 80% cut to their programming. That may be true if we don't talk about eliminating any staff. We don't talk about eliminating any internal services. If you say we're only going to take it from programming or not going to reduce staff, then sure, yes. But I would imagine a staff reduction would be in order. And therefore, programming would not have to take the brunt, the entire brunt of the hit. Um, so I had a lot of other questions. Uh, if we always move on to uh, vote on Commissioner Hawes' motion at this point, but uh, you know, at some point, uh, it needs to be identified what percentage of MSU extension funding goes toward the specific services. Um, you know, he dismisses the, uh, the rather the gentleman from MSU Extension dismisses the things like the 4-H program and uh, Master Gardening program as being inconsequential compared to some of the other programs. If that's the case, let's eliminate those programs, specific programs, and allocate the money to this block grant program. I don't want to belabor the meeting any longer. We do have a motion in front of us, Commissioner Hawes' motion. I think we should move on to vote on it, but I do think we should... Okay, Recognize. but I have one more speaker, and I'm going to let him speak, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Kraft. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to Commissioner Hoff for bringing this up. I had a really difficult time laying off five employees when we've done so much work the last eight months to keep our employees and to keep them going strong with everything that has been going on. So I am supportive of this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have no more speakers, so we have a motion in support to amend. Please vote on the uh, motion, the amendment. The motion to amend passes 10 to 2 with Commissioners Carabelli and Drolette voting no. Okay, now the motion having been amended, we have motion and support. Please vote. The motion passes 10 to 2 with Commissioners Carabelli and Drolette voting no. Okay, thank you. So we have dispensed with A, a B, and C. Uh, we have no correspondence. Is there any new business? I don't blame any of you. <laughs> Public participation. Does anyone wish to be heard? Anyone wish to be heard, please hit star six if you're talking on your phone to unmute. unmute. Okay, I don't see. Madam Chair, motion to adjourn. Uh, motion to adjourn by Gillette. Support? Support. Support by Support to... Yep, please vote. The motion passes 12 to 0. Thank Get it in while you can, Commissioner Gillette. <laughs> not many left, that's for sure. <laughs> not many left, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you guys. You guys have a good evening now. You too, Leah. <laughs>
Thanks. All right. Take care, guys. We'll see you. <laughs>